We assembled here today are issuing a new decree to be heard in every city, in every foreign capital, and in every hall of power. You could feel a sort of chill descending on the assembled diplomatic corps as we listened. And it actually started to rain just about the time he starts to speak. And we'd been given plastic ponchos. We were all struggling to get into these. George W. Bush kind of completely tangled in his plastic poncho as he tries to get this on. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. Thank you. No word about allies. God bless America. No word about a community of like-minded nations. It was a wake-up moment, and, and, and um, that left me almost speechless. We expected an outsider who would want to make his mark, but we didn't expect a disruptor of that sort. He was putting the marker down, and he was saying, we want to have alliances with other nations, but we want to renegotiate the terms. Nobody ever told me that politics was going to be so much fun. One of the most divisive presidents in history, riding roughshod over conventions at home and abroad. Now, for the first time, Donald Trump's closest advisers and foreign leaders reveal how he ripped up the diplomatic rule book and took America to the brink of nuclear war. I didn't throw my hands up in the air because I would have lost the phone, but I thought this is exactly the wrong thing to do at this time. Il avait trouvé cet accord stupide. L'accord sur l'Iran était un accord conclu par des stupides. Euh, des stupides dont la France était. Hein. In this first episode, Trump locks horns with America's closest allies. We're like the piggy bank that everybody's robbing, and that ends and makes friends with old adversaries. NATO was probably in the greatest peril it's ever been in its history. Donald Trump's rise to power was based on a promise to reforge American foreign policy. In the days after his victory, his switchboard was buzzing with world leaders anxious to know what America first really meant. Okay, who else? Let me see that piece. Brad and Dan both call. I get Brad for me and then Dan. Okay. Donc, la conversation avec Donald Trump a été assez surprenante. Il me dit que Paris est la plus belle ville du monde, qu'il est en admiration par rapport à la gastronomie, par rapport au vin, par rapport à la culture. J'ai essayé de mettre la conversation sur les sujets qui, qui moi, me, me préoccupaient. Le climat, l'Iran, la question aussi de l'économie en général. Mais euh, il les a évacués. C'est vrai qu'il y avait de quoi être surpris, étonné, amusé. Mais en réalité, c'était de l'ordre du simulacre. Je sentais bien qu'il allait bouleverser la donne internationale. Five, attention. Jump. The first foreign leader to get a taste of Trump in the White House was the British Prime Minister. I'm in the lead car with the Prime Minister. And the first thing I notice is that the President has come to the front door to meet her. So I'm already thinking to myself, that's different. I also thought to myself that was quite a positive, nice gesture. The personal chemistry between President Trump and Prime Minister Theresa May was not great. Um, President Trump thinks of himself as a strong leader, and he likes to work with other strong leaders. And part of that is his business background. You know, in New York real estate, it's one of the most elbows out, toughest businesses there are. And the image that she gave was one not of strength. Trump had long railed against some of America's traditional alliances. May's priority 
was to persuade him to stick with the most critical. When Trump said, well, what are we getting out of NATO? Maybe we shouldn't be in NATO. The media all went crazy. Oh, Donald Trump's going to withdraw from NATO. No, he's not. He just wanted to cut a better deal. It was very, very clear that Donald Trump was a man of business transaction. And so she went straight in with, with what she wanted. She said, we can't give a message that we're undermining such an important institution. She said to him that NATO was the cornerstone of Western defence. She said, I want to say in the press conference, Donald, that you are 100% behind NATO. I hope you can agree that I can say that and that you will agree with me publicly. The special relationship between our two countries has been one of the great forces in history for justice and for peace. And by the way, my mother was born in Scotland. Stornoway. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. On defence and security cooperation, we're united in our recognition of NATO. As Mr. President, I think you said you confirmed that you're 100% behind NATO. The special relationship looked like holding strong, perhaps too strong. He held her hand going through the colonnades, which took us all by surprise and took Teresa by surprise. But I think she felt she couldn't really take her hand back, so she was stuck with the hand in the hand. Um, and the first thing she said was, yeah, I, I need to call Philip just to let him know that I've been holding hands with another man before it hits the media. <laughs> Before May could call her husband, Trump treated her to lunch. When Theresa May sat down, a conversation began that I don't think even the British could have anticipated, uh, because it was our president in full blossom, in full bloom, uh, and a stream of consciousness that ran the gamut from his own inauguration to his sustain for the press in the United States. Prime Minister wanted to Talked to him about Putin. Uh, she'd heard him say some quite positive things about his potential relationship with Putin during the campaign. She wanted to tell him what she thought he was like. She asked him, have you spoken with Putin? And the president said he had not. But at that point, the chief of staff spoke up and said, Mr. President, uh, actually, uh, President Putin has called you, uh, but we're busy scheduling a, a return call. Trump at this point looks not orange but red. He flipped furious. He said, you're telling me that, that Vladimir Putin called the White House and you're only telling me now during this lunch? The president dropped his shoulders for a moment, looked at the prime minister and said, I don't believe this. Vladimir Putin is the only man in the world who can destroy the United States and I didn't take his call. Honestly, you could feel the tumbleweeds just completely take over the entire lunch table and, and my toes were curling. He seemed to realise that he was playing out in front of the British delegation and the Prime Minister, uh, an unseemly moment in his, uh, the early days of his administration. So he changed the subject. He asked Theresa what her position on climate change is and Theresa was halfway through something about how she's a big you know, ardent fan of, of uh, conservation. Um, and then suddenly he, he stops again and, and he says to the National Security Advisor, Mike Flynn, you, you, you're telling me that, that Vladimir Putin called the White House and you didn't tell me. You didn't tell me. Trump was still fuming about his team when he spoke to the French president the next day. De la trope me dit, voilà, vous êtes un président, il parlait de moi, hein, euh, vous êtes un président expérimenté, vous connaissez bien les états unis Est-ce que vous avez euh, des conseils à me donner pour la composition de mon équipe euh, euh, à la Maison Blanche J'ai considéré que c'était peut-être une politesse, mais qu'il y avait quelque là, euh, une forme d'extravagance, comme si moi j'aurais appelé le président Obama au moment où j'ai été élu, en disant, vous connaissez bien la France, est-ce que vous pouvez me donner un nom d'un conseiller Donc, mais, euh, Prenez donc Henry Kissinger, il est encore très, euh, très à l'aise, euh, très fluide et, et très clairvoyant. Alors là, j'ai senti que c'était lui qui était un peu désarçonné, euh, parce que ça, ça lui paraissait être une proposition assez audacieuse, qu'il aurait mieux fait peut-être d'accepter en réalité. Like his British counterpart, Hollande was worried about NATO. This time, 
It was a harder sell. Le président Trump m'a pas dit qu'il allait quitter l'OTAN. Ce qu'il m'a dit euh, tenait à une phrase. Nous ne voulons plus payer pour vous. L'argent des Américains doit servir aux Américains. Et les Européens doivent payer pour leur propre sécurité. NATO had long been the bulwark of Western defense against Russian aggression. And the US paid the most for it by far. Trump wanted Europe's richest country to foot more of the bill. Oui, aussitôt euh, que le téléphone avait raccroché avec euh, Donald Trump, j'appelle euh, Angela Merkel pour lui donner la teneur de, de la conversation. Euh, elle est elle-même assez euh, préoccupée par ce qui va se passer, parce que c'est pour l'Allemagne, euh, l'Amérique qui la protège. Euh, C'est-à-dire que l'Alliance Atlantique, ça compte pour euh, les Allemands. By the time Trump arrived in Europe for his first official trip, the atmosphere had become increasingly hostile. But Europe's leaders were keen to avoid a clash with the most powerful man on earth. Everybody was very curious. We had read a lot about President Trump in the media, but uh, President Juncker said to me, look, let's first of all see how he really is. In politics, you have to dance with the girls in the ballroom, and he is now in the ballroom, so let's work it out. Hmm? Sitting next to the president was his Secretary of Defense, James Mattis, a four-star general who'd fought alongside European allies. He turned to General Mathis and said, so, General, what do, you, what do you think about the EU? And General Mathis looked at him and said, Mr. President, uh, we think the EU is great. They're great partners, great to work with. We do a lot of good work with the EU. And you kind of, <laughs> you saw the president. It kind of looked was, oh, that's not exactly the answer I expected. Mattis was one of those known to Washington insiders as the adults in the room which also included new national security advisor, H.R. McMaster. Many hoped they would be able to rein in the president from his most extreme plans. Black up! That afternoon, they lined up at NATO's brand new headquarters, where Trump would unveil a memorial to 9-11. I think there was a misunderstanding, or really an underappreciation for the degree to which allies had sacrificed uh, in, in our common cause. It was a considerable concern on the part of allies and, and, and <laughs> on the part of me as, as well. And so it was important, I think, to explain to the president what is in it for the United States. The first time NATO goes to war is when the United States is attacked on 9-11. They were there not because they'd been attacked, they were allies, they were partners, they, they had shared values with us. NATO's leaders were anxious to see whether Trump would affirm his commitment to their mutual defense. NATO members must finally contribute their fair share and meet their financial obligations. This is not fair to the people and taxpayers of the United States. They didn't want to have to give up their subsidies and the, and the free rides they were taking. But President Trump insisted he was just going to those countries and saying, it's time for you to do your fair share. Trump looked at NATO contributions as something that countries owe to the U.S., like a tenant owes um, the rent to the landlord. It was quite unsettling for NATO members, quite unsettling. There were doubts whether the president um, is still standing 100% behind NATO. The next day, the Allies met again at Trump's first G7 summit. Entrer en relation, comment avoir des relations avec cette personnalité un peu particulière Euh, le premier, donc, nous avait dit, il est très important que vous ne... Don't be patronizing. 
towards Trump. Donc ne le prenez pas de haut. Et deuxièmement, c'était don't gang against Trump. Top of the agenda, the Paris Accord. The most important agreement ever in the global effort to combat climate change, signed by nearly 200 countries just a year earlier. Trump thought it placed unfair restrictions on US industry, and in the spirit of America first, he wanted out. The other six heads of state explaining to him that this is a multi-hundred-plus country deal. It's never going to be perfect when you get that many countries involved, but we have to start from somewhere, and we can try and improve it. Prime Minister Trudeau talked about the impact of coal production, and President Trump said, "Well, Justin, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, that the science is entirely right." And uh, uh, Mr. Trudeau said, "Well, uh, I think you're listening too much to the coal industry, Donald." Chancellor Merkel said, "Donald, look, this is a serious matter. It's the fate of the planet, and we have the capacity in the G7 in discussions like this to lead." And he nodded. Trump refused to sign up to the end of summit statement, endorsing the Paris Accord. Their first bruising from the president left Europe's leaders shaken to the core. The Zeiten, in denen wir uns auf andere völlig verlassen konnten, die sind ein Stück vorbei. Das habe ich in den letzten Tagen erlebt. Und deshalb kann ich nur sagen, wir Europäer müssen unser Schicksal wirklich in unsere eigene Hand nehmen. Back in Washington, the so-called adults in the room joined the resistance. A number of us in the administration made the case to the president to stay in the Paris Accord. We felt as if there really there wasn't a downside to staying in because it wasn't mandated. There weren't going to be penalties. So the idea was work within the agreement and, and try to reform it. We're showing the president he should understand that he's not doing this for corporate America. Even the oil and gas companies who are taking out full-page ads in The Washington Post, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, begging the administration to stay inside of Paris. We made sure that the newspaper ads went onto his desk or into his reading pile. But it's not 100% clear what his final decision is going to be. Thank you very much. In order to fulfill my solemn duty to protect America and its citizens, the United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. The president had tapped into really the sentiment that the American people didn't have a direct say in these agreements. So this was like a mini Brexit for the United States, right? It, there was a belief among the, you know, the citizens of the United States that this agreement had surrendered their sovereignty to some sort of progressive agenda uh, that they did not support. Where does American leadership owe its allegiance, to the people of the United States or to the global community? I was elected to represent the citizens of Pittsburgh, not Paris. It is time to make America great again. Thank you. New exclusive reporting that Russian officials discussed having potentially derogatory information about President Trump and his top aides during the campaign. Five months into his presidency, concerns over Russia's role in Trump's election were mounting. Jared Kushner also being looked at for his uh, conversations, communications with the uh, Russian ambassador. The Justice Department has appointed former FBI Director Robert Mueller to oversee the investigation into any possible connections between the Trump campaign and Russia. As Mueller's investigation got going, 
The president arrived at the annual G20 summit, where he'd meet Vladimir Putin face to face for the first time. The president's male goal was to just have a sit down with Putin. He was of the view that given his own personality, he would be able to spark off good chemistry. Uh, we're going to have a talk now, and obviously that will continue. Putin did most of the speaking. So the president had to listen while Putin spoke at great length in Russian. There was the issue of Russian interference. And the president was clearly uncomfortable in dealing with the issue head on. He associated any discussion of this uh, with his own legitimacy as president. Putin was obviously making it um, noted that they had not interfered and basically uh, dismissing this out of hand. That evening at the gala dinner, the seating plan raised a few eyebrows. We learned late on that the Germans had made for us the inconceivable decision to sit the first lady next to President Putin. They could have placed her next to anyone in the G20, but no, they had to pick President Putin, knowing full well that everybody would be scrutinizing every interaction. And so President Trump went over, as was inevitable, to talk to his wife. Trump sat with Putin for almost an hour as the other leaders looked on. One of them was the Australian Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, who was after his own one-on-one -on -one with the president. During a break, he took his chance. Donald said, Malcolm, do you want to see my skiff? It is so cool. And I had no idea what he was talking about. I thought he was talking about a boat. And we turned around a corner and there was this big steel box about the size of a shipping container and he said this is so cool he said when you're in there nobody can hear you not even the chinese it's so secret trump pulled turnbull into the ultra secure communications hub with the new french president emmanuel macron in tow turnbull wanted to confront trump over steel tariffs another america first policy instead the president brought up a deal for the US to take refugees from Australia. Donald turned to Emmanuel Macron and he said, Emmanuel, do you know Malcolm has 2,000 of the worst terrorists in the world locked up on a desert island? I said, they're not terrorists, Donald. He said, no, no, they're the worst, they're the worst. Emmanuel, and you know what's worse? Now, I've got to take them. And he looked, turned to Emmanuel and said, Emmanuel, do you want to take them? Macron was, had no idea what was going on. He was naturally, he was, he was speechless. When Macron left the skiff, Turnbull finally managed to get Trump onto tariffs. It became a very detailed discussion. He said, well, what sort of steel are you? What's, what is this steel you're sending to us? It wasn't very much, to be frank. And I said, well, it's basically uh, from a company called Blue Scope that then turns it into a roofing product called Colorbond. And his eyes lit up. Colorbond, he said, I know that. He said, they sell it in gold. He said, he said I remember it when I, I used it in Brooklyn. Trump agreed a special deal for Australia. And Emmanuel Macron left Hamburg, keen to build his own relationship with the US president. But his predecessor had given him some advice. Lorsque, selon la tradition républicaine, j'accueille Emmanuel Macron, je lui dis n'attends rien de Donald Trump. Ne pense pas qu'il sera possible de le contourner ou de le séduire. N'imagine pas qu'il ne va pas appliquer son programme. Macron pushed on regardless. Knowing Trump's love of grandeur, he pulled out all the stops, 
hosting him at the Bastille Day Parade. A hundred years after America joined its allies in the First World War, the US president was made guest of honor. Je ne sais pas s'il le fait toujours d'ailleurs, mais c'est vrai qu'au début, affirmer, comme je le disais, son autorité de alpha mâle euh, en euh, démontant l'épaule de, euh, de son interlocuteur. Et, euh, et Macron a répondu euh, en autre alpha mâle. C'était quasiment une scène primitive de la jungle. Hein. C'était deux alpha mâles qui se rencontraient et qui se reconnaissaient. Trump vient du milieu de l'immobilier new-yorkais, qui est un milieu de tueurs. Hein. Il avait dit justement à Macron, il avait dit « What do you think of May and Merkel ?» Macron n'avait pas répondu. Et Trump avait dit « They are losers. » For all Macron's efforts to woo, Trump's eyes were elsewhere. The president loved the parade. Whenever you have a band on horseback, you know, how do you top that? On the way back on Air Force One, he goes, hey, how come we don't do parades like that? So you get with the Department of Defense. And so I, I happily gave that over to Secretary Mattis and said, you know. <laughs> In Washington, the Secretary of Defense feared Trump's America First agenda was threatening the security of both the US and its partners. Secretary Mattis invited me over to the Pentagon one day for lunch. We discussed, um, should we try and put together a presentation? There had been building concern that the President of the United States, that Donald Trump was uh, abandoning a lot of our allies and partners around the world. And so Secretary Mattis felt like the best way to help convince President Trump of the way forward was to provide him with a briefing. Mattis wanted Trump to come to the inner sanctum of the Pentagon, a conference room known as the tank. General Mattis said, look, the president has yet to come over to the Pentagon. I'll roll out the red carpet, um, literally, literally. And I said, that's great. Winston Churchill summed it up pretty well when he said the only thing harder than fighting with allies is fighting without them. In other words, you need allies. And history is very compelling that nations with allies thrive and nations without allies wither. President Trump was a few minutes late to arrive. Uh, he enters the conference room, quickly takes his seat. His body language already seems negative. Uh, he seems kind of dour. Those of us in the control room look at each other and say, uh-oh. We all had specific pieces of the presentation to talk about military might, intelligence might, security might, economic might. Secretary Mattis turns to the president and says that, you know, Mr. President, the reason why you have so many men and women arrayed around the globe is not only just national security, but for economic reasons. They're defending American jobs, they're defending our economy. It gives America a lot more than what it takes. President Trump just proclaims, my God, look how much money we are spending on everybody else. What is America getting in return? We were getting a very good return on investment from a economic, military, intelligence point of view. The president was not nearly as convinced. He crosses his arms and scowls and started careening from topic to topic like a squirrel caught in traffic. He turns to Secretary Mattis and says, my God, did you see the handshake with President Macron? He, he wouldn't let go, it just lasted forever. He told Secretary Mattis, whether it was 4th of July or Memorial Day, he wanted to have tanks rolling down Pennsylvania Avenue. He wanted to fly over with military jets. So as I'm watching from the control room, I'm shifting uncomfortably. Do you normally associate this type of parade with an authoritarian regime like China or Russia or North Korea? I can see from the monitors that everyone in the room is dismayed with the direction this had taken. At the end of the meeting, you know, all, all of us had felt like we had put together very robust presentations. And I think we all walked out of there 
frustrated that we didn't make our point. Yeah. The meeting was great. We had a very good meeting. In the months that followed, the frost deepened between the president and the so-called adults in the room. Soon enough, most of them were on their way out. Then, in March 2018, Trump's loyalty to America's allies was really put to the test. When former Russian spy Sergei Skripal was poisoned with a deadly nerve agent in the English city of Salisbury, intelligence services quickly suspected an assassination attempt by Putin's Russia. This was an egregious attack. I mean, it was using a banned nerve agent to commit murder in a way that endangered hundreds, maybe thousands of British citizens. And so we took this very seriously from the beginning. Of course, briefed the president. The president was somewhat skeptical about the whole affair because he saw this as spy on spy. It is now clear that Mr. Skripal and his daughter were poisoned with a military-grade nerve agent of a type developed by Russia. The prime minister announced that the UK would expel 23 Russian diplomats suspected of being spies. She hoped Trump would follow suit. The phone call was a little tense at first. The president kept saying, are you sure? Are you 100% sure? And Theresa May was very firm and said to the president, we're 100% sure. Prime Minister was saying, this is a moment when your international leadership on an issue as serious as this is absolutely critical. And if America does something substantial, then the rest of the world will follow. And if you don't, and Putin will take this as license to this kind of thing in other places, you know, at other times. The president said, of course. Even though he was still skeptical about all of the information, this was really no choice but to stand up and to support the United States' closest ally. Trump agreed to expel 60 Russians, expecting the Europeans to follow his lead. But when Britain's allies announced what they would do, France and Germany said they each had just four suspects to expel. It was underwhelming. I mean, it was, uh, it was disappointing. The president let me know about that. That was so these were these were my last days in the, in the White House. And I, I was happy to bear the brunt of, of uh, the president's ire on the, on the way out. Setting off for the G7 summit in Canada, Trump seized a chance to confront the Europeans over Russia and restore his relationship with Putin. Russia should be in this meeting, whether you like it or not. And it may not be politically correct, but we have a world to run. Four years earlier, the G8 became the G7, when Russia was expelled for invading Ukraine. Trump's proposal stunned the Allies. It is evident that the American president and the rest of the group continue to disagree on trade, climate change and the Iran nuclear deal. What worries me most, however, is the fact that the rules-based international order is being challenged. Quite surprisingly, not by the usual suspects, but by its main architect and guarantor, the US. The first night of the summit was unusually tense. My prime minister said, Teresa, you've had uh, the most recent experience with uh, Russian activity. Why don't you speak to it? And Prime Minister May did. And President Trump said, well, Russia's an important country. I don't see why uh, Mr. Putin shouldn't be here. Uh, and we, when we host, we're going to invite him. And Chancellor Merkel said, that would not be a good idea. I know him. I have spoken with him. He is not like-minded. He does not belong here uh, at this time. Uh, to which President Trump simply said, well, we'll see Angela. 
Later, as the leaders were serenaded beside a campfire, their advisers fretted over how to get an agreement on the end of Summit's statement, the final communique. So I'm sitting in the dark corner of this hotel and I'm reading this and I'm not liking it. I'm not liking a lot of things. I didn't like it on trade. I didn't like it on environment, climate control. I had a lot of problems with it. And I realized the president would never buy into it. With key points still outstanding, the leaders managed to drag themselves away from the evening's entertainment. Chancellor Merkel said, well, what's wrong? And I said, well, the problem is a lot of this is not consistent with um, President Trump's policies. And so we didn't want to write it in a document that, frankly, we would not uh, wind up supporting and rather have no document, to be honest. The Europeans see it as a great chance to gang up on the American president and try and force through language that they can then later use against the United States. The sticking point was what the G7 described as the crucial role of the rules-based international order. In the opening paragraph of every G7 uh, communique, you speak about our commitment to the rules-based international system. Huh? John Bolton uh, suggested it should be a rules-based uh, uh, system uh, instead of the rules-based international system. Huh? And of course, this was something totally different huh? because there is not, it's not any rules-based system. It's the one we all believe in, that democracy values in, in uh, trade uh, for the benefit of all of us. My retort was, look at this, Americans. This is a structure that you set up. 1945 onwards, we were with you. This is the system that has served us for decades. Why are you now challenging that? Because it does not fit your particular interests at this time. I would be happy if we never issued another communique at another G7 summit. And I tell you, the world wouldn't change a bit. The leaders went to bed leaving their officials haggling through the night. By morning, there was no compromise. There's a breakfast session dedicated to gender equality, and President Trump arrives, I would say, 20 minutes late. I can tell you at least the women around the table were not particularly amused about that. I was worried that since the issues were still not resolved, but with the summit coming to an end, that the temptation to press us to give up everything would increase. So my plan was to leave even earlier than uh, Trump had already planned, get him out of the room, uh, get him into the beast and get to our helicopters so we could leave. But for whatever reason, the Europeans must have sensed the plan and they literally forced us into a corner of the room. All the leaders stand around uh, President Trump, who sits there with his arms crossed like that, and discussing with him the communique. My own boss, uh, President Juncker, didn't stand around bowing in front of President Trump. He had taken the seat 10 meters behind the crowd, and President Trump shouted, where is Jean-Claude? And uh, President Juncker shouted back and said, I'm here, Donald, but I'm not participating in this charade. President Trump saying, well, I'm, uh, I, I'm leaving, and I guess there's something we have to work out. And a few of us said, well, there's the language on the rules-based international order. Officials came up with a last-minute ploy. The communique would use the American phrasing of A in the opening lines, but use the further down the document. President Trump immediately said, OK, well, that's, that's fine with me. I don't care. I nodded at my prime minister and said, you know, that's OK. President Trump could then, uh, could then leave and say, OK, it's done. After this uh, very turbulent uh, negotiation on the communique, uh, all the leaders gather on uh, a terrace, get a bit of fresh air, a glass of water, and they sit there and all oh, they really look shaken uh, by, by what they had just witnessed. The helicopters of President Trump uh, leave Chalvoir. And the whole uh, terrace is shaken, the leaders are sitting there and they are uh, psychologically shaken and now they're also physically shaken. And I think everybody realizes that uh, we have witnessed a turning point in international relations. 
the United States of America is no longer willing to be the pillar of the rules-based international system. The world is a different place and uh, is in great danger unless we all stick together now. Bonjour à tous. Hello. Now, I know you'll know that we had some strong, firm conversations on trade. I highlighted directly to the President uh, that Canadians were polite, were reasonable, but we also will not be pushed around. Trump saw on the TV, on the plane, Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau holding a press conference where he thought Trudeau was saying unkind things about him. Bolton raised the point that how bad it looks for the U.S. president to have the G7 leaders, presumably the allies, taking shots at him. You know, what kind of signal is that to Korea and China and the rest of the world? Every bit of this was unnecessary. If the Europeans had not been so insistent on their points, we wouldn't have had the blow up. From Air Force One, Trump tweeted that he would withdraw his support for the communique. It was the first time a leader had ever refused to endorse a G7 statement. Fans of America First were delighted. It lit the fuse for an explosive showdown with the Europeans. We go away on Monday. I'm going to tell NATO, you got to start paying your bills. The United States is not going to take care of everything. They go out and they make a gas deal, oil and gas from Russia, where they pay billions and billions of dollars to Russia. Okay? So they want to protect against Russia, yet they pay billions of dollars to Russia. And we're the schmucks that are paying for the whole thing. The annual NATO summit was just the start of a three-stop trip that would culminate in the president's first one-on-one -on -one meeting with Vladimir Putin. So I have NATO. I have the UK, which is in somewhat turmoil. And I have Putin. Frankly, Putin may be the easiest of them all. Who would think? Who would think? Before Trump could get down to business, there was the obligatory entertainment laid on for NATO's leaders. When the president met NATO Secretary General, he was in no mood for the usual dance of diplomacy. Good morning, everybody. Many countries uh, owe us a tremendous amount of money for many years back, where they're delinquent, as far as I'm concerned, because the United States has had to pay for them. We're watching the faces and the body language of the U.S. delegation, and you can tell that President Trump's remarks are every bit as a, a much of a surprise to them as they are to those of us in the control room. You have General Kelly, who is the White House Chief of Staff, who suddenly becomes very interested in the flags off to the side. You've got the ambassador to NATO, uh, Kay Bailey Hutchison, who just has this look of complete shock on her face. It's very sad when Germany makes a massive oil and gas deal with Russia. Germany is a captive of Russia. It was a surprise, that's for sure. I had heard every president with whom I had served say that the Europeans need to spend more on their own security. I think um, all of us were surprised uh, that it was just so direct. Trump waited until the last day of the summit to reveal his boldest move. I was on the way from my hotel to our ambassador to Belgium's residence where the president was, was staying. He called me on the car phone and said, uh, you're ready for something big? I think we should withdraw from NATO this morning. And uh, 
quite coincidentally, our, our connection was cut off. So I had about five minutes in the car to figure out what to do. And I immediately tried to get Pompeo, Jim Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, John Kelly, to say, all hands on deck. I think it's serious this time. We couldn't find Mattis. He was having breakfast with the Canadians. I thought maybe he was defecting. Maybe it had gotten too much for him. As the leaders took their seats, they were expecting to discuss expanding the alliance. Before the meeting had actually begun, he called me up to the table and, and uh, whispered, shall we cross the line? And I said, no, I, I, I would go up to the line, but I wouldn't cross it. And I tried to explain why I didn't think we should withdraw from NATO. And he just nodded, and I, I went back to my chair. I didn't, I didn't know what he was going to do. I didn't know whether he had been persuaded. NATO is about uh, Europe and North America working together. To... I'd only been Foreign Secretary a few days, and I imagined that this was going to be a, a fairly normal, business-like summit. In fact, it turned out to be a moment when NATO was probably in the greatest peril it's ever been in its history. The president uh, just started right out. He uh, went person to person, and, um, and he knew what they were not doing. And so he called them out. It was very tense. Trump put Angela Merkel right on the spot. He was on the warpath and tore strips off Germany with, I think, real anger. He said, we're there defending you. And by the way, we've got a huge trade deficit with you, but we're there defending you and you're not paying enough for it. It was based on the fact that Germany didn't spend anything like as much as America on defense as a proportion of its GDP, was building a gas pipeline to Russia that was going to make Russia very rich and also had a trade surplus with the United States. These three things came together and they set Trump off. Trump called the other NATO members deadbeats who owed their freedom to America. Then he said that if they didn't pay up, the US would go its own way. He combined the, the attacks on Germany, very tough attacks on Germany, with some warning about NATO's future as a whole. Nobody uh, believed or could imagine that the United States, which was seen as the leader of the free world, would put that basic commitment into question. Merkel sat there very calmly. When it was her turn to speak, she just very softly said, no one needs to talk to me about freedom. I grew up in East Germany under the Soviet Union. I know what it's like not to have freedom. You could not get a bigger contrast in personality between the, the fiery, emotional, rambling President Trump and the cool, calm Angela Merkel. Desperate to pull the president back, Trump's fellow leaders pointed out that they had already spent billions more on defense since he took office. The idea was uh, to present the contributions of NATO members as a response to the president's demands. And that's, I mean, at the end of the day, that's true. Also, Germany is contributing more in terms of defense spending. Other countries are doing as well. So the president um, was convinced to give a press conference. It's about the content, yes. It's also about dealing with that very unique personality. We are doing numbers like they've never done before or ever seen before. And since last year, they've raised an additional $33 billion uh, that's been put up by the various countries, not including the United States. Well, honestly, he put his toe over the line, but then he pulled it back, uh, again, a fairly Trumpian experience at the end by saying that he was a thousand percent in favor of NATO. But it was as close uh, as you could come without actually crossing the line fully. Never forget seeing Secretary Mattis. It was the most visibly upset, the most visibly angry I'd ever seen him. 
uh, he feels like President Trump had called not only into question the strength of the alliance, uh, but it called into question, more importantly, America's willingness to stand by its allies and partners. And could America be trusted and taken at her word moving forward? We understand your message, but some people ask themselves, will you be tweeting differently once you board the Air Force One? Thank you. No, that's other people that do that. I don't. I'm very consistent. I'm a very stable genius. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. That evening, Theresa May welcomed the president to Britain for his first official visit. Someone had brilliantly worked out that Trump was a big Churchill fan, and so the decision was made to put on a dinner at Blenheim Palace, and um, it was absolutely magnificent. I'd done an interview with Fox News in which I defended the president's call for European countries to spend more on defense. He came straight up to me, grabbed my hand and said, great interview on Fox News. He said, I said to the people around me, I don't know who the hell that guy is, but he's doing a great job. And uh, that was my first lesson as a diplomat, that if you want to get through to President Trump, do an interview on Fox News. The two-day visit came only months after the Salisbury poisonings. And once the formalities were over, the Brits turned to Trump's upcoming summit with Putin. The great nervousness is that this is a president who likes to deal with other strong men and isn't that interested in traditional alliances. We wanted to make sure that he wasn't going to suddenly do some rash deal with Putin. And so we were trying to stiffen his resolve. We talked about why Salisbury was such an affront, not just to the UK, but to the whole of the West, whole of the international community, the Russians could behave in that way. My opposite number said, this was a chemical weapons attack on a nuclear power, to emphasize how significant it was. And Trump looked at Theresa May and said, oh, is Britain a nuclear power? Uh, I, I will say the British stiff upper lips held, but their eyes were wide as saucers. Trump spent the weekend at his golf course in Scotland. His team hoped it would be a chance to prepare for his encounter with Putin, because this time it would only be the two men and their interpreters. Well, everybody was having a real problem in trying to basically get the president to sit down and have a briefing. Our preparations were uh, really not adequate at all, but he wanted a meeting with Putin, and he wanted it more than uh, almost anything uh, because he wanted to show that uh, he was defying the talk in Washington about Russia collusion. The meeting with Putin would take place on neutral ground at the presidential palace in Helsinki. Nearly three decades earlier, in the very same building, George Bush Sr. and Mikhail Gorbachev held a summit that helped bring the Cold War to an end. Now, Trump sat down with Putin for another meeting that could define US-Russian relations. The two men talked alone for more than two hours. I was worried that Trump would give away something that really was serious and complicated that he was not fully prepared on. When they broke, Ambassador Bolton had to pull the president to one side to try to kind of figure out what had actually happened. Trump said uh, he did most of the talking, meaning Putin, and I mostly listened, and I thought, that's great. How did the meeting go, Mr. President? I think it's a good start. 
And we go into the lunch and the president says, Vladimir, why don't you tell my team what you've discussed? Trump raised the issue of Russian interference in American elections. And uh, in fact, we, we learned at the lunch from Putin himself uh, that Trump had raised it first, which was important for the American president to do. Putin makes it very clear that um, the Russian state is not involved in uh, any interference. And it really got my attention that he'd said the Russian state, because he wasn't actually denying uh, that Russians, Russian individuals, Russian entities had been involved in any kind of interference or efforts to influence. He was just basically saying that the Russian state apparatus had not been involved. Before Trump was home and dry, he had a press conference to navigate. I have just concluded a meeting with President Putin. The president made his opening remarks and then Putin made his and it seemed actually reasonably OK. And then we had the questions. OK. The final question from the United States will go to Jonathan Lemire from the AP. I was sitting in the audience and I thought the maximum danger points had been passed. Thank you. Uh, question for each president. President Trump, please, you first. Um, just now, President Putin denied having anything to do with the election interference in 2016. Every U.S. intelligence agency has concluded that Russia did. Who do you believe? I knew that this would set off the most defensive reaction from the president, because it was him being asked, will you not, President Trump, admit that Vladimir Putin elected you as president of the United States? My People came to me, they said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this, I don't see any reason why it would be. But I really it became, frankly, an utter disaster. Uh, my initial thought was just, how can I end this? I literally did have in my mind the idea uh, of faking uh, some kind of medical emergency and throwing myself backwards with a loud, blood-curdling scream into the uh, media. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. We didn't know what to say, but it became clear as the press conference ended. And I think we both sat in our chairs as everybody else was getting up and, and walking away that a firestorm was going to erupt, and it did very quickly thereafter. Uh, an extraordinary uh, press conference. Um, we do now have a statement just in from Senator John McCain. There's a powerful statement. Senator McCain says, Today's press conference marks a recent low point in the history of the American presidency. How much do you think that Putin gained from this meeting? Uh, he knows he gained a lot. I would guess he's having caviar right now. Instead of standing up for our democracy and democratic principles, President Trump cowered in the presence of Putin. That will be the last time you ever have a foreign leader meet with the president of the United States privately. Within 24 hours, Trump backtracked claiming he'd simply misspoken. But the damage was done. In the next program, the president turns to the Middle East, taking America to the brink of war. President Trump basically outsourced his foreign policy towards Iran, to warmongers. If this had blown up, in his face, if there were civilian casualties. The whole world was watching. What influence did Trump's extensive use of social media have on global affairs? Discover the impact of Trump's tweets at bbc.co.uk slash Trump takes on the world and follow the links to the Open Universe.